Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining what uh, promises to be a very exciting session uh, on the use of AI to help address the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this session is organized by Trends Research and Advisory uh, and is part of uh, their series uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, eForum, which includes uh, other events around COVID-19. My name is Khalid al Kofahi, and I am the head of research at Thompson Reuters, and I'm talking to you today from Toronto, Canada. It is my pleasure to welcome our four panelists, uh, Dr. Munir Nazal, uh, Professor of Vascular Surgery at the University of Toledo, Ohio, USA. Uh, Dr. Sapan Desai, the CEO of Surgisphere Cooperation, uh, Chicago, USA. Dr. Conrad Kartz, Head of Minimally Invasive Surgery at Ludwig Maximilian University Clinic in Germany and our robotics expert, Dr. Bartek Stanchek, uh, an engineer and uh, a doctor at uh, Asira Engineering, also from Germany. Uh, this session will uh, consist of four presentations uh, of 15 minutes each, followed by 20 minutes of question and answers, question and answer and discussion. Uh, we welcome and encourage questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them through the YouTube chat. Uh, before we start, just a couple of comments, if I may, uh, about sort of what's happening with AI and, and machine learning and COVID. And the amount of work that has taken place uh, on using AI and machine le learning to address or help address COVID-19 is truly impressive. Uh, this morning, I uh, ran a query, uh, AI for COVID-19 on Google and received uh, 2.6 billion results, roughly. Uh, I scanned, looked through the first 15 pages uh, just to make sure that they are legitimate and they, they all seem to be in point. And the range of use cases that are being addressed uh, using AI and machine learning cover at least uh, four areas. Uh, there are certainly other areas, but are, these are the four areas that uh, I was able to see. Uh, diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and the epidemic, the study of the epidemic itself. On the diagnosis front, we see a number of applications being developed focused on detecting COVID-19 from X-ray images, CT scan, and other non-invasive techniques. And uh, Dr. Sapan from Surgisphere and his company developed uh, one such application. Dr. Conrad will, will talk uh, about using chatbots and robotics to help diagnose uh, COVID-19 patients as well. And there are other sort of, uh, certainly other interesting uh, research going on. Uh, some uh, focus on the severity of infection and predicting outcomes to help physicians uh, stratify cases and decide who should um, be admitted to the hospital and, and who should be allowed to recover at home. On the treatment front, uh, we see a number of machine learning studies and explorations taking place. Uh, for example, uh, Google's uh, DeepMind are focused on predicting the 3D structured proteins, uh, which will help scientists understand the shape of the virus receptors and identify drugs that could uh, disrupt how it binds to human cells. Uh, other uh, researchers are focusing on using machine learning to accelerate vaccine development, uh, and others are trying to discover uh, um, drugs that could be repurposed to fight COVID-19, for example, by looking at uh, um, other viruses that share certain elements with uh, the novel coronavirus. Uh, on the prevention front, we see an increased use of robotics to help prevent spread, spread of disease. Uh, for example, by using robots to sanitize services, monitor people's temperature, using thermal camera, uh, cameras, or even monitor compliance with uh, wearing masks. And uh, Dr. Bartik will uh, probably cover some of these areas in his presentation. And finally, uh, at the societal level, uh, a lot of work is taking place using machine learning to study the pandemic itself and to build models to inform policymakers and healthcare professionals. Uh, for example, using machine learning uh, to forecast number of cases, potential deaths, not just at national levels, but also at local levels and correlate that with local policies and other attributes of, of local populations. Uh, one of the... Uh, interesting examples, and I don't know how well it works with all honesty, that I came across 
uh, is uh, studying the impact of the lockdown on the mental health of people yeah? by analyzing the tweets related to, to COVID-19 using natural language processing technologies. So with that, um, uh, let's start with uh, our first presentation. Uh, I think we start with Dr. Munir. Uh, Munir, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you for um, the Trend Research Organization and for uh, my co-panelists for this opportunity. I cannot claim that I'm a COVID expert, but I'm a physician by training. And also we are trying to use artificial intelligence in everything we can nowadays. I will uh, try really to cover the important parts in research and treatment, especially. And uh, of course, it's not going to be an exhaustive uh, mentioning of what's going on. Otherwise, we need a uh, long time, as uh, Dr. Kofahi mentioned, there are millions of uh, hits on the internet related to this problem, which nobody talks about this problem. We know when this uh, COVID-19 started, it's a, uh, it is a SARS virus. And this is not the first pandemic we face but uh, it is perhaps the first pandemic in our lifetime of this magnitude affecting many countries. And it was declared um, by WHO on March 11 as a pandemic, although it started December um, 2019 in China. This shows you how the spread and this changes every day, of course. The most important part that the first predictors for this um, uh, virus was really artificial intelligence predicted that it's becoming an, a pandemic and two uh, artificial intelligence areas which is blue dot from Canada health map in in uh, the US predicted that it might be one uh, it, it will be uh, an issue for the future and they even wrote a paper uh, from blue dot saying that this in pneumonia people talking about is going to spread to the world and it will spread with the air travel. Uh, they relied on advanced analytics, natural language, and uh, then uh, they uh, relied on other sources, medical reports, tweets, Googles, queries. And although this is very exhaustive and extensive, it carries a lot of risk with it because that's what we call the noise uh, news or the noise media it doesn't carry facts with it that are all the time facts. Artificial intelligence, there are different types, but we can, or different ways of looking at it, but the simplest way is there is a huge data and you put this data in some form of integration by a computer program to predict something and give you an explanation. You can say the big data is the diagnostic basics, the explanation is the treatment, of course. And these are the areas where artificial intelligence is going to work. Early warning, tracking, treatment, diagnosis. Munir, um, we are not seeing the presentations. Oh, I'm sorry. It, <laughs> it says share it though. You don't see it? No, I see. Okay, let's a see again. A picture of a beautiful island. What about this one? I, I don't see it still, forgive me. I, I, maybe you have two screens. No, I have one screen are... only. It okay. is only one screen, I'm sorry. Liste Attilio, stop sharing, then I'll do it again. How about that? Yeah, yes. Maybe, uh, yeah. This Not yet, it's probably coming soon. What about now? Um, It's probably loading because it says you are starting to share screen, but we don't see the slides yet. Okay. Again, share. Did you stop sharing yourself, Khaled? 
Um, I did. I I'm not sharing, but I can. I can try to share. You need to something. stop sharing, perhaps, so that I share. If you stop, yeah, sharing. yeah. I I did not share. Maybe Conrad, you gonna stop sharing, Conrad? Yeah, I I'm not sharing. Okay. You should hit stop sharing because it says another unknown uh, thing in my way. I think maybe it's a recording. Maybe it's the recording that is. Let me verify with. Mm -hmm. So I stopped sharing again. Okay. Yeah, this. Um, so there is a PowerPoint unknown that is interfering. Yeah, I, I don't see it, but let's let's continue talking and then let me see if we can figure something out from this end. Okay, anything? No, unfortunately, no. So I will continue. The, yes, yeah, please, please go ahead. So the, the areas and artificial intelligence gives medical experts a hit, a very strong hit start in starting or uh, instead of looking at the data in different ways, they just have the data but put it together. So it is somebody running a marathon, but he starts in the middle of it rather than at the beginning of it. That's what really artificial intelligence. If we talk about treatment, which is the part I'm talking about, in the treatment part, really, the artificial intelligence will try to get the new drugs discovered and if it does that it does that almost five to six times faster than the conventional method we know or it will look at the drugs that are already there and that being used um, and it try to see if they have a use in the treatment of the current problem which is in this case the covid most of the time the drugs take about 10 years to be discovered cost about two to three billion dollars if they are really huge but with 90% failure. But with artificial intelligence, it's much shorter, perhaps two to three years maximum. And the failure rate is lower because you got rid of the noise in the discovery. So it really reduced the time and reduced the cost. Um, so what we're looking at with COVID now, most of the time what we are looking at, mostly non-new drugs. It is repair pushing of the drugs that have been used for something else. Um, and the drugs to target coronavirus most of the time by combining data from a different mechanism, looking at the knowledge, other drugs similar to it or other problems similar to it, other epidemics in the past, and then put the scientific data of the mechanism of action and then examine more the virus, see what else can work like it worked on a similar virus and use those drugs. That's pretty much. And we talked about the Google DeepMind, which predicted the structure of the protein of the virus for a while now. And people are using this structure really in order to come up with the new medications. But in, in the Google Mind uh, group, they said we emphasize that these uh, structure predictors have not been experimented verified. And that's the problem with most actually artificial intelligence related to science. You need to verify it. We cannot be certain of the accuracy of the structure uh, that we are providing. That's what Google Mind said. And that's pretty much one of the problem. Deep learning based drug target interaction model like different drugs. And uh, one of the drug group that was found that might work is the antivirus. So a group from uh, Korea, actually, they looked at the different antivirus medications and they found that some of them might work on coronavirus. And that include one of the drugs which called Acta Zanavir and works on HIV and they use it for the treatment by COVID virus. Then there are three more drugs. All of them are antiviral. But these are prediction studies. Prediction study says we think it will work, but we don't know if it will work. We have to prove, so we need another study. 
one of Please, the can tracks I, that I, mm -hmm. can I just one one quick note the the organizers would like me to stop sharing Okay. Uh, and just continue talking, please. Yeah. Okay. So Thank I need you. to see my slides, though. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just don't share. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so one of the drugs is actually uh, what we call it uh, the one of that being developed by L. Lilly for a long period of time since 2018. And it inhibits kinase. And they found that actually one of the mechanisms of COVID virus work is through kinase. Uh, cytokine storm and if you prevent that you will decrease the respiratory and the storm that comes with the COVID virus. The drug is called paracetinib and uh, it was that through artificial intelligence they identified 370 kinase inhibitors and then they narrowed it down to six of them through artificial intelligence a process that might take actually months if not years to reach to this conclusion, but they managed to do it by only uh, three researchers, four researchers over three days. If this has to be done through the usual way to get the same answer, you need 250 researchers, they estimated. So this is one of the advantages. And this was done by a London-based artificial intelligence company called Benevolent. And they actually looked at the virus action, the drug action, and then they said that might work in COVID virus and is going to be tried. And the, med the medicine is there, it's called Olimium and people use it for other viral HIV and other medication. Actually, this is specific drug also used in rheumatoid arthritis and it's been used for rheumatoid for a long period of time. And because of its potential, um, it's in the market, the complications are known uh, so it will be one, perhaps one of the first drugs to be used. It entered between actually one of the universities and benevolent uh, to go with uh, Ili to doing the study soon. It is actually the main function of this drug to be on the respiratory uh, functions. Uh, and uh, it's published already in the Lancet uh, in February 15 as one of the potential drugs for the future. Then there is another group in the research gate. They identified a number of TRAP screened drugs through artificial intelligence, including antiviral and other medications, at least six of them, uh, Brevalidin, I'm not going to go through all the names, uh, Nicosamide, and Reserbine is another one, and they think that might work, and they publish it actually um, recently in one of the journals by a group of uh, uh, um, researchers from Singapore. What about the vaccine? The vaccine is another area that artificial intelligence will help by looking at the components within the virus similar viruses or other problems looking similar components and come up with a basic understanding of the virus and then basic understanding of the vaccine and the candidate for the vaccine. These two steps are completely covered by artificial intelligence. But then after that, you need to put it, of course, in a preclinical trial and then clinical trial, then you need to do a regulatory approval and production. That takes a long period of time, but because of the urgency, they expect there might be a vaccine very short. And actually they started trying once uh, in the last two days and they think it might work, but of course it will take a long time before we know it will work or not. And the, the artificial intelligence made this vaccine actually uh, uh, to happen in a short period of time much better than waiting through the regular processes. Um, then there are other medications that will combine the antiviral and the anti-inflammatory treatment because nobody understand the COVID, how does it work very well, but they know it's a virus penetrate the cell and it uh, multiply over a short period of time into millions of uh, molecules and viruses. And then it paralyzes the cell until it disrupts all the functions of the cell, causing inflammation in many parts of the body even remote areas and causing also hypercoagulable conditions. They think a combination of antiviral, anti-inflammatory might work. And this being also published in the Lancet recently looking at that potential. 
there are many drugs, uh, many companies working on the drugs currently for artificial, using artificial intelligence for the COVID virus, including South Korean company, Hong Kong company. Uh, there is the uh, a company in in, in Paris uh, working between um, artificial intelligence and another company in California combined effort. Um, the other one, uh, UK based company, which is working with Script uh, on the research, uh, in addition to the London company uh, Binovalent that I mentioned about. It is very helpful to get artificial intelligence to provide us the data we need, but it has a major problem. So what artificial intelligence look at a huge number of data, a lot of it is noisy data or outlier data, such as Twitter, Facebook, media or different parts. So to filter that information sometimes is the difficulty. The other problem is the data privacy. So the privacy of the information and the privacy of the companies, privacy of the individuals is going to be affected by this sharing process. And it will raise also multiple questions about the public health concerns for the individuals. And uh, the main actually function of this large data now might not be at this current pandemic. Hopefully, and hopefully it will not happen if this happens in the future and people thinking there will be another attack of, uh, of COVID virus sometime in even fall, perhaps we will be more prepared using the artificial intelligence uh, to counteract um, this. Recently, there was a coalition of um, artificial intelligence company called C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute was formed, including a number of universities, Microsoft, Princeton, Illinois, University of Chicago, Berkeley, uh, Carnegie Mil uh, Mellon University and others um, to have a powerhouse between artificial intelligence and those six universities asking for grants and people to cooperate in order to reach some form of a treatment, prevention, and others related to COVID. Actually, Dr. Desai and myself in one of those grants, we applied to one through uh, somebody in uh, Carnegie Mellon, because they have to be one of those universities. Hopefully we will get the grant soon. As I said, the pitfalls, big data, algorithms are unknown. We don't know how people can reach to the conclusions. It is a very black box. Nobody knows the conclusions are reached how. There is a lot of noise from the social media. There's a lot of filtering that is required. The fake news, what we hear all the time nowadays, fake news and data, bad data is a problem. Lack of accurate data. People like every now and then they claim there's a drug works, that drug works, but then people go back and look at it is not working. This lack of accurate data, outlier, noisy data, make actually artificial intelligence role a little bit affected nowadays, although its job to bring the drugs into uh, existence is really a major job. And it is improving the access to those medications uh, that hopefully in the future we will have. With this, I will stop this part. I'm sorry for the technical problems and I'll leave the stage for other colleagues now. Thank you, Dr. Muni. Thank you so much. And uh, next, uh, Dr. Conrad Kartz uh, will start his presentation. You are on mute, uh, Dr. Conrad. Right. Now it should be better. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And I am honored to be here with you uh, in this important uh, uh, webinar event. The cybernetic revolution started actually for years and uh, with the pandemic and the global lockdown, we have the experiencing a quantum leap of uh, artificial intelligence development, especially in medicine. It is impressive how many cases we find uh, where the artificial intelligence is used against the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, let's focus on diagnostic. I'm a surgeon, but uh, uh, because of uh, my 
personal interest in artificial intelligence. I'm also a part of uh, some uh, diagnostic procedures, but I screened a little bit the, the internet and uh, I was uh, surprised that we have so many uh, uh, used of, of uh, machine learning, in, especially in diagnostics. And uh, I'm very happy about that. So let's see what, uh, what I found. I will share my screen. Uh, yes. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Is this now completely? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen. Thank you. Uh, great. So then uh, first, uh, uh, let's talk about chatbots. Um, uh, chatbots uh, for COVID-19 diagnostic, what are the, what's, uh, what is doing so the, uh, so the chatbots? They're asking questions about tanker temperature, the typical symptoms, uh, travel history, geolocation, and so on. And what we can receive, we can evaluate the likelihood of the person is being infected. We can estimate the risk. We can give the information about the hospitals which are in the region where the patient can, uh, can go or use. And uh, the chatbots are using mobile tablets and, and computers. Uh, today, the hospitals are really under the stress and uh, the chatbots are helping the personnel, the staff, uh, the doctors and the whole staff of the hospitals to reduce the footfall uh, they are currently experiencing. experiencing. In US, uh, the CDC together with Microsoft created a chatbot, which is uh, very, very, really nice. I, I chatted, I tried to, try to use it, but it is only for the U US citizens. In the EU, we have something uh, very similar. It was, uh, uh, we were starting with it in the end of April and uh, it's, uh, it, its name is Symptoma and it's uh, really a very good solution for, uh, for COVID-19 to, to get the patients the feeling they are uh, pretty well. Uh, if the hospitals of uh, uh, hospitals uh, 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 corporations are getting into this area and uh, I was very surprised in Germany, we have more than 20 chatbots for COVID-19, which are different in the different hospitals, but uh, uh, in general, uh, they are very similar to each other. Uh, but uh, I was concerning about something completely else. When we collect the whole information, which we can uh, get from the chatbots, I think on this base, we can make a very important social uh, political decisions. And uh, this is maybe the, the most important uh, uh, news for everybody and uh, the need to, to use the chatbots for the, uh, uh, for the uh, diagnosis of COVID-19. We have also in the hospitals completely different problem. Uh, there are patients who don't know they are infected, that they are as patients there and they are potentially dangerous for the others. So they are uh, patients with, which are asymptomatic with infection and uh, they are also dangerous uh, for the others. They are patients who already are admitted in the hospital, but they can, could be potentially infected from the uh, patients, other patients, or even from the hospital staff. And uh, we was uh, thinking about uh, how we could uh, possibly uh, be focused on such a uh, dangerous uh, case. And we uh, tried to, uh, to make a program for and install some sensors in the hospital, in the patient's rooms, uh, who are be able to automatically detect the occurrence of cough, fever, uh, high re uh, higher heart rate or higher breath uh, frequency. What uh, allows us uh, uh, to tell about, about uh, such a situation. We can focus to make the COVID-19 testing and we can introduce the faster isolation. Uh, so in the same time, we can improve the patients uh, and the personal safety. So the screening and uh, artificial intelligence screening or machine learning screening uh, 
should be installed in airports, railway station, public administrations, uh, buildings, maybe also in the big factories. Uh, why? For the same reason, because uh, when we close the, the, this extreme unusual situation right now and start to run the business, start to opening all the uh, public facilities, we will have the problem with, uh, with the rebound of uh, and uh, getting again the bigger number of the infections. And uh, this uh, simple uh, screening could allow us to Im implement some a little bit more safety and maybe uh, uh, we will not have to close uh, make um, again the close down for the uh, for the all population i was uh, uh, looking in the wikipedia and i found something what is uh, uh, absolutely amazing it is uh, uh, I, I copy paste it in this slides and I, I will read it uh, shortly. Most of people infected with, uh, I don't want to say what it was, develop higher fever, cough, shortness of breath, and, uh, and so on, so then severe pneumonia. And uh, so with intensive care is often required. What was it? It was uh, influenza A uh, from the birth. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, amazing. It was in 2013, and it was also the time where we introduced in the airports the screening for the uh, uh, for the fever uh, from the patient from the uh, all the passengers. Uh, another uh, very interesting tool was developed by uh, Surgis Fair Corporation in Chicago in USA, and they um, recognized. Uh, the infection of COVID-19 by almost 100%, only based on machine learning, which included the uh, initial presentation of the patients by hospital admission, complete blood uh, count with differential, and the findings of uh, uh, X-ray of the chest. And it is amazing what we could conclude after examining only only a group, a small group of patients, 5,000 patients, it is not so much. It was uh, 37 hospitals were involved, but the, uh, what is uh, incredible also in medicine, it was the positive detectivity uh, value was uh, more than 99%. The ne negative uh, predictive value was also not more than 99%. Sensitivity, 99%. Uh, percent and the specificity also one, almost 100 percent. I really don't know any other diagnostic tool uh, which we are using right now which have such a, uh, uh, such a values. In Germany this is also the project where uh, we are taking part. Uh, we are we started to uh, do some applications by deep learning on the CT scan, uh, CT scans by COVID patients. And uh, we saw immediately the uh, promising results. Results, and uh, then uh, there was the idea to start the project for more clinics, and uh, uh, we created the page, and uh, get some some funds for that with machine learning to predict the patients uh, um, and uh, permanent or in the ICU to the to see the disease progression. And then afterwards to allow uh, maybe the uh, uh, as survey uh, analysis. This is how the page uh, looked like. Uh, we have uh, seven clinics right now and uh, more than 40, uh, 100 cases uh, which are already in. And I do believe we can share also this software for everybody in the whole world uh, who wants to use it for clinical purposes. In summary, I would like to say that uh, uh, machine learning and AI and innovation uh, actually is uh, is our disposable tackle uh, for the coronavirus virus outbreak. The new complex problems require modern solutions, and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is one of it. And everything we learn now will prevent and reduce the new pandemic's appearance with the other pathogens in the future. 
Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Conrad. Very, very interesting talk and presentation, and I'm sure we'll generate uh, lots of questions uh, from the audience and uh, from fellow panelists. And I think next we have Dr. Sapan Desai. Uh, Sapan, do you want to take it? All right, wonderful. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I trust that you're able to see my screen. Is that correct? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone. It is a privilege and honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. And uh, to my friends Munir and Conrad, thank you for uh, mentioning some of the work that we've been doing. Um, Conrad, I appreciate the slides around uh, some of the tools we've developed, and, and thank you for highlighting some of those. Um, my name is Sapan Desai. I'm a vascular surgeon here in Chicago, and I'm also the president and chief executive officer of a company called Surgisphere. Surgisphere has been around since 2008. It is a cloud-based healthcare data analytics and medical education company. And uh, really what we do is we are a real-time global research network. We have over 1,200 healthcare partners on six continents. We work with hospitals, we work with medical practices, we work with physicians. And really at the end of the day, as a physician-led public service organization, our goal is to improve the quality of clinical research and the health of all patients. And so we are all in line in terms of achieving better clinical outcomes using data, using machine learning, advanced analytics, artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, and together combined with some very rich data sources, trying to improve the safety and efficacy of the medical devices we use, the pharmaceuticals we come in contact with, the clinical management algorithms we use in clinical practice. All of it is uh, destined to help improve the cost of care as the costs continue to escalate over time. And at the end of the day, we are also trying to achieve scientific collateral, evidence-based medicine, uh, things that lead to high impact publications. And so how our system works is, as mentioned, Surgisphere is a cloud-based data analytics system. Um, we are, through our partnerships with hospitals and whatnot, we have uh, data acquisition that happens directly via the electronic health record. We also have a very unique point of care uh, data uh, source uh, that allows to, uh, us to capture point of care information about procedures, uh, SF36 quality of life surveys and, and more uh, using a combination of machine learning, natural language processing and automatic conversions with a very good data dictionary. We're able to convert that information combined with other sources of data like supply chain and financial systems to uh, really capture a very large amount of healthcare-based information. This is very different than a public administrative data set, uh, different than a claims-based database. Um, we are actually capturing some very detailed, very rich information around patient demographics, their comorbidities, various medications that patients are taking, and uh, imaging results, again, through natural language processing and image analysis, point of care information, uh, capturing data on uh, some, of the some of the patient care aspects uh, that relate to procedures and seeing a patient in clinic, uh, measuring outcomes, harmonized to value-based metrics, uh, pay for performance type metrics, uh, looking at the hospital course of a patient, looking at the follow-up for these patients as well. And all together now, since uh, at least 2010, we've collected very detailed information on uh, about 240 million unique patient encounters. It comes out to well over 100 million unique patients. And remember, each of these encounters has literally a thousand plus data points attached to it. So this is a petascale, petabyte-sized uh, database that exists today. In addition, uh, one thing that we realized in March is as we were collecting real-time information from our global research network, we realized that we had a very detailed information on 160,000 COVID-19 patients in the database today. And so all of this, we're an ISO 9001 and 27001 certified organization. We're independently audited. The work we use is, the work we do is, is used for FDA real world evidence purposes. And the ISO certifications mean that it, we've reached a very high level of data security and data integrity. The reason all this matters, um, especially around COVID-19. Can I ask you to, if you would please make, sorry to interrupt, uh, make uh, go to presentation mode, full screen. If I go to presentation mode, you'll lose the presentation. Okay, never mind. Yeah. We'll stick with this one. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Um, so in, in terms of why this is so important, um, the big data we're capturing includes a lot of elements around the patient care, which become very important when you start doing clinical research. 
We, as clinicians and researchers, want to know more about the patient's demographics, their comorbidities, the various factors related to their hospitalization. If a sick COVID-19 patient gets admitted, we want to know how sick are they? What are their Q-SOFA scores? How, what is their oxygen saturation? What are their vital signs? What are their presenting symptoms? What medications were they taking before they came to the hospital? What medications were started de novo in the hospital? As you can imagine, this is a tremendous amount of information. And so all of this feeds into our software which is called Quartz Clinical. Uh, it was ranked number one for machine learning by Frost and Sullivan in 2019. Um, and all of this has been used to create what we truly believe is next generation informatics. Unlike other large registries and public data sets, which are missing values are not comprehensive and are incomplete, through our system, which has automated data acquisition, recovery missing values, it's a cloud-based data warehouse with enormous computing resources behind it. We're exceeding the data collection standards that have been created thus far by other major regulatory agencies. Um, when you combine that with artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities, you are looking at something which starts to be transformative in healthcare. It's no longer iterative, it's hopefully innovative. And so now if you believe that we have a large big data repository that you can mine for clinical research, the question becomes, how do you do it? How do you do the data analytics behind this and apply it to a model like COVID-19? And so for those of you familiar with machine learning, there are dozens of different algorithms you could use and a dozen, and a dozen different ways to use the algorithms. One algorithm that became very important for us, and, and all of this is done using fully de-identified data. There's no protected health information or anything like that in this database. So it really makes it open for collaboration and research. Um, one of the algorithms we looked at was a random forest model and very sophisticated machine learning algorithm. Unfortunately, it's also a black box as, as my colleagues have already have mentioned. Um, and so when you start going into scientific peer review processes, you're dealing with some an application that you want to do on an exascale basis, roll it out to the world, um, where you may have a quarter million people using an application simultaneously. That's not necessarily using a very complex convoluted neural network or a deep learning model or random forest model. Sometimes we have to make trade-offs for practical purposes. And so I'll get into some of those details in a second. Uh, the, the big benefit of using a more classic machine learning model like decision tree analysis is that it's more transparent, maybe more suitable for peer review. And until the rest of the scientific world catches up to understanding the true potential around some of the more sophisticated machine learning models like random forest, support vector machines, convoluted neural networks, and more, we may have to walk everyone through this uh, so that they're all at the same level in the next few years. Um, a good example I want to give of some work that you can achieve with big data and, and with a with a kind of backbone we've built is a publication that we published um, in the most recent issue, the New England Journal of Medicine. This was in their May 1st issue. And so with my colleagues at Harvard and uh, at the VA uh, universities uh, uh, throughout the United States, uh, we have an article on cardiovascular disease, drug therapy, and mortality in COVID-19 patients. And this is truly big data. It was 8,910 patients collected from 169 hospitals on three continents. And the database since that point has swelled significantly. Now it's over 160,000 patients coming from hundreds of hospitals on six continents. And the premise of this paper is that we looked at the role of various cardiovascular risk factors and their association with mortality in COVID-19 patients, and no big surprise, but obviously things like coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and arrhythmias are associated with a greater risk of mortality. Surprisingly, uh, and this is very important, we found that medications like ACE inhibitors and ARBs and statins are not associated with mortality. Uh, this is, it's, a, it's an important finding. There are millions, hundreds of millions of patients using some of these medications. And now we have evidence that says that these medications are not associated with a greater risk of death. In fact, there's a signal that says that there may be something else going on with these medications. This is an observational study. This is not a randomized controlled trial. It does not show cause and effect. But the, the point here is that we have used big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, cloud-based dynamics to get to a signal here in a way which is not possible using classic research tools that are available to us today. This, is the, this sets the stage for the next important randomized clinical trial in this arena. And so 
There, that brings up uh, another tool that we've already developed around uh, COVID-19. And my friend Conrad and Munir have already mentioned some of this um, in their talks. Um, using our data acquisition system, our AI-based data warehouse, we collected data on over 56,000 COVID-19 patients, looking at their clinical outcomes, generating a risk score, using machine learning applications, and then taking it all the way from the design stage, the measure and an analysis stage, all the way to completion with a web-based application. And what we developed was a very sophisticated, yet very simple to use severity scoring tool. And so as the number of COVID-19 patients around the world increased into the millions, we're replicating what happened with the 1918 flu. This is leading to severe stress on, with our limited resources. And so it's critical to improve care efficiency. And part of that algorithm means gauging the severity of illness is very important. And so at surgesphere.com, we've developed uh, a series of free tools. So as mentioned, we're a physician-led public service organization. We are here to make the world a better place. These tools we've developed are here for international use by anyone who wants to start delivering higher quality, more effective care using a tool built off literally tens of thousands of patient data points. And so this allows real-time reporting. It gives a recommendation as to the severity of a case and really allows physicians to understand uh, just how severe that patient is in terms of uh, whether they'll need oxygen or antibiotics or, or critical care in a mechanical ventilator. And so this has been put together as a publication. It's been submitted to a leading medical journal, and we're expecting this to be in print, hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, what we've created is a tool that has an overall accuracy of 86.4%. This is a generation ahead of any kind of multi-variable regression analysis. This, this is truly high quality, very fast, applicable machine learning that's transparent for clinical science and publication purposes. And so we developed this in conjunction with frontline healthcare professionals, public health experts, and, and this tool has now been used all around the world hundreds of countries um, used by over a quarter million frontline healthcare professionals on six continents. It's part of how academic medical centers and other hospitals are implementing care uh, management pathways for COVID-19. And in conjunction with the International Federation for Emergency Medicine, the African Federation of Emergency Medicine, we've implemented this as a public health tool at more than a thousand hospitals throughout Africa. It's been featured by the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at the UK. It's been highlighted in an editorial by a leading public health authority. This was published in the African Journal of Emergency Medicine by my friend Lee Wallace, uh, who is the head of emergency medicine at Cape Town, South Africa, where he talks about how important tools like this, data-driven machine learning tools are to delivering higher quality, more effective care. These tools save lives. And so one point that I wanna make is when history recants COVID-19, this is going to be about how we use big data and artificial intelligence to solve problems. This is what is going to catalyze our entry into 21st century medicine. And this is what makes us different than what happened in 1918 with that terrible pandemic. And so a few, a few points I, I wanna make is we are here for physicians, hospitals, and societies. We are developing international partnerships. We have endorsements from international uh, collaborators where we're helping to deliver higher quality care for a more affordable cost. We use machine learning powered analytics. We have real world applications for this information. And at the end of the day, this leads to what everyone is going after, which is high value healthcare. We're looking for improved clinical outcomes, value-based purchasing wins, making care more affordable, decreasing hospital readmissions, and getting transparency throughout this entire process. The end goal for COVID-19 is we want a data-driven approach that leads to real advances in care and lives saved. Again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm happy to provide any more information about who we are and what we do. And uh, please stay safe as the pandemic continues to unfold around us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sapan, and, and nicely done. Uh, and thank you for your work and, and uh, dedication to uh, providing better uh, healthcare for everyone. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Bartek. Hello, everyone. I'm trying to share my presentation as well with you.
Is it working? Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be with you to, tonight. And that's the title of my presentation, Using Robotics to Ensure Social Distancing. And I was thinking, what, what shall I say about robotics ensuring social distancing? And then I realized that, well, you may have robots to basically to force you to stay at home, but this is not what you want. You don't want to just be distant from other people. You want to really act. You want to do and achieve what you would do if there was no social distancing. So I thought about converting this title into reaching the unreachable because this is fits more what we are doing at, in my company, Acrea. We want to go to the areas which we couldn't reach otherwise. We want to achieve the unachievable, to reach the unreachable. And this is what the surgeons do when they enter human bodies, to reach the unreachable areas of the human body, to enter an isolation ward where the patients are and you want to help them. You want to go to some distant area where you wouldn't go normally and you want to do something there. You don't want to. This is how we can maybe assure social distancing when we enable people to do what they are used to do with robots while staying in a safe distance. So we, in Accra, we're thinking how to empower people to do what they do, to help other people. And this is one of our patients or our, uh, say, uh, users. He's a tetraplegic, his name is Jan, and he, uh, you know, he stays in uh, uh, wheelchair the whole time. And for, because he cannot move his uh, limbs, he cannot move his arms, he cannot move his, move his legs. For him, we've built this uh, robotic arm, which basically replaces his own arms and using this arm and this uh, control system, he's able to live the independent life. He's e able to reach the otherwise unreachable bottle of water, uh, some piece of food which is on the, on, the, on the table. And basically this brings me to my, uh, how my journey with robotics started. It started in, 2000-ish, in early 2000, uh, in uh, TU Munich. And this is a slide from my early research where we had the project about uh, high fidelity telepresence and teleaction. Telepresence means to be present somewhere where you couldn't be uh, because there is uh, some barrier. Uh, in this pandemic times, it's, it's of course easy to imagine the barrier, which is the possibly some door in a, in a hospital, um, iso, uh, be closing the, the, the clean and the, the dirty area. Back then we we're talking about catastrophic scenarios when you would have a robot going, entering a dangerous area and you would, I don't know if you can see my mouse, and you would control this robot using all the control inputs, controlling the robot's motion, the arms, the legs, the vision, the head, the voice, and, 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 and whatsoever. Back then, we were also working about giving this robot the sense of touch, uh, which th that's why this robot has a force sensor. And we were working, first of all, on robots which you can touch. So our robots were uh, not like, you know, some industrial robots being in locked in cages, but the robot which you can really touch because it would have uh, recognized that you touch it, it would measure the forces and it wouldn't harm you. So this otherwise dangerous and stiff device uh, made of you know aluminum, steel, and 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 and, and etc. By giving it the sensors, we would enable it to be human capable. And using this robot, we would control it using an input device to touch the environment, to sense that we have a soft sponge or a more uh, rigid object like this cone. And we would feel these forces. 
We are so proud to be the first in the world back in 2003 to be, to, you know, to screw a screw in six degrees of freedom. And this was an experiment which was made between a university in Munich and the university in Berlin. And we were able to screw this screw with, uh, with a force sensor. We were also working on mobile telemanipulation. So you would have a mobile robot uh, with, a, with a platform to enable the mobility and the head with a stereo camera. So as you can see, it's like a full embodiment of a human operator and the robot moving in a dangerous environment. We were also giving this robot a sense of uh, uh, touch in terms of uh, uh, fully uh, actuated uh, robotic hand with three fingers, being able to grasp and feel the forces. So this is, as I said, 2005. These were the times when the artificial intelligence were not so uh, elaborated and so advanced so that we thought we still, we still need a human to take decisions. We still need a human to have the human perception of the world. I wonder if this has really changed. We still need people to take decisions and we, we have artificial intelligence, we have machine learning to support us in perception, in analyzing big data, but I think we still need humans. In this case, we will need doctors to take critical decisions. So either if we, if we have robotics, if we have big data and we have machine learning, I think we'll still have doctors to take decisions. Why am I talking about it? With uh, my company, which is Acrea, and it's located in Germany and Poland, we make robots for R&D. So for more than 15 years, We've been building robots for different research projects. And we started with this one here on the left. It was a robot uh, which would enter uh, human space, uh, urban space in the city of Munich and would ask people how to get from A to B. For us humans, it's, it's a very simple thing. We just ask the way how to get to the Marine Platz and people would answer. However, it's not that easy to understand this question. Some people would say, go left at the big building. Someone would say about a church and someone would mention something, something completely different and would, they would all mean, uh, mean the same thing. And you want this robot to interact socially with people so that it keeps the, all the social distance and the social uh, regulations that we, that we observe. So it would have also, uh, what you can see here, it has a face with facial expressions. Um, here on the right, it's, I think the video is over already. We had a project about uh, skill transfer from humans to robots. So we, this pick and place is a good example where you have a human just moving an object from A to B and robot trying to do the same thing just by observing uh, the, the humans uh, manipulating the objects. This is how we learn uh, uh, and uh, basically our living uh, uh, organisms. This video shows how robots could share the workspace of, uh, of a car garage with humans mm, manipulating big and heavy objects. Um, what I want to point out is these are these uh, projects where we support, as our company, we support uh, researchers from uh, universities, uh, mostly in, in Germany and uh, in Europe, with uh, bigger research, research projects. And uh, I would like to tell you about this one. It's called Remedy, it's called me Remote Medical Diagnostician, and it's about remote ultrasound. We, we were working on this project like five years ago, and back then it was difficult to convince people that we really need it. 
Now you don't have to convince anyone that you need it. What is it? In the normal classical situation, typical, when you have a doctor sitting next to the patient, holding the ultrasound probe and observing the ultrasound on, an, on, the, on the screen, you may get infected while, if the patient is, is, is COVID positive. So <clears throat> what we want to do, we want to keep the doctor in a safe distance, controlling a robot, moving the probe and touching the patient and uh, also uh, manipulating the probe with force feedback so that the doctor can, can feel the, uh, the forces that are measured at the same time. They can talk to each other because we have a, of course, teleconferencing system. We had a very nice consortium with uh, universities, um, European universities. And this is how the robot looks like. It has an arm with an ultrasound probe. It has the 2D, 3D cameras and the whole teleconferencing system. The robot is more or less anthropomorphic. So it has a head uh, where the face of the doctor is shown. Here's the console uh, with a 3D screen uh, with an ultrasound screen and with a teleconferencing app. You have the joystick to control the head, the ultrasound controls, and you have the input device for controlling the probe. The patient and the doctor, they can talk to each other and the patient can set up the position of the robot's head to have the optimal view. And on the robot, you have all the cameras and the ultrasound device. So the robot is like fully, full embodiment of the, of the doctor. It has an arm and the assistant is putting the, the arm in the vicinity of the patient. It doesn't have to be an assistant, still the doctor can do it. But we, back then we thought we don't need this, this barrier. So we had an assistant uh, pre-positioning the robot. Here we have the doctor controlling the robot with force feedback. We, for this project, we chose ambitious, ambitious uh, scenario of uh, echocardiography uh, to make it more difficult so that you need to really find the sweet spot between the ribs to, uh, to see the heart and to perform the diagnostics. So as you can see, it's possible to do it. And we had like six, 700 kilometers between the doctor and the patient, and it was working. Here you have the beating heart uh, seen remotely. So it, is, it was possible back then. I think it's possible still today. So what we envision is to have, you know, completely autonomous diagnostician at some point. Uh, where we have, right now, we have the remotely controlled robot. Uh, using this robot, we can sense the motion of the, of the diagnostician. Again, observe the skill transfer. We want to transfer the skill from the human doctor onto the machine performing the diagnostics. Ultrasound is really difficult. It's not just a picture like, uh, like an MRI or CT scan. So you have the, the fusion of the, of the image of the force and of the position on the, on the body. You basically look inside the body of the, of the patient in real time. But having this, having this interface between the doctor and the patient, we can have this data to, to um, learn this. So we really envision to have uh, AI engine learning this to have a fully autonomous diagnostician. I think I'm running slightly, slightly run of, uh, out of time. So we had many of these projects. This is a, pro, a, a, pro, a prototype of a robot for um, dementia patient. So we envision a robot living in a private house with a patient, and this is the uh, architecture of this robot living in the, in the private house. So you have a monitoring modules of the patient and of the, of the environment. You have modeling engine of the human and in the environment. And you basically have a robot performing uh, care, give a task in a, 
in a, in a home environment. The most important turn to be a fall detection. So we can monitor and recognize the case, the incident of a patient falling down. And I'm sorry, my computer is dying. Just a second. I'm back. Okay, just two more slides about uh, the human robotics, uh, which we are talking, uh, talking and working on the whole time in our company. So <clears throat> the robots which live in human uh, environment, there are, as I said, there are different robots than robots from, from the industry. They need to have the sense of touch and we conceive these uh, special drives for for uh, uh, robotic systems with force sensors and all the sensors and compute computing included in the drive. So we have a series of these drives, including, as I said, the whole sensing plus different shells to give the robots different shapes and different functionalities. So we can have, for example, a robot for, for ultrasound on an assistive arm. And uh, coming back to our first patient, we have developed an arm for tetraplegic patients, which we put on the arm, on the, on the wheelchairs, and we enable them to eat and drink and eat and uh, live the independent life. So this is what we are doing. We have the whole palette of robotic systems. Some of them can be used for fighting COVID, some not. We of course want to have the whole system of robots enabling interventions, diagnostics, and also we have a uh, uh, system for uh, logistics in, in the hospital. And based on this project, actually what we are working right now, we're working on a disinfection robot. Uh, so we have a mobile platform equipped with various disinfection means. So we have UV light, we have a nebulization device, we have ozone generator and et cetera, et cetera. On the mobile platform, which is first controlled from remote distance, from a safe distance, and second, the robot will move uh, autonomously in the in the say isolation ward. And this again, we had uh, hospitals coming to us and asking for this. So obviously, there is a strong need uh, for them to uh, to disinfect uh, basically any areas in in their on their premises. So this is what keep us busy. We're not sleeping since a week working on this on this project. This is uh, the status as of today. So hopefully we will go to the hospital uh, to test it uh, in in maybe two or three days. So please uh, keep fingers crossed that we we succeed with this. And just to sum up. We have Jan here giving high five to his father for the first time in his life using robotics. Thank you. Thank you, Bartek. Fascinating work. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been um, such a fascinating session. Um, my bar usually is, you know, uh, did I come out of any session smarter or knowing more than when I uh, went into it and you certainly exceeded that bar by, by a large margin. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we heard from uh, Dr. Munir about uh, using AI and machine learning uh, on treatment and discovery and the importance of, of data and, and noise and data. We, we heard from uh, Dr. Conrad 
uh, about using chatbots and other uh, robotic technologies for diagnostic and how accurate some of these technologies are. Uh, we heard from uh, Sapan how he is changing the meaning of evidence-based medicine and uh, uh, fascinating work. And, and uh, of course, we heard from uh, Dr. Partik about uh, how to use robots uh, in ensuring that there is some distance and uh, reducing infection rates for healthcare workers. And hopefully one day each one of us will have their own private physician uh, if all goes well. So fascinating work. We have a number of questions from the audience and uh, as well as a number of questions that uh, you know, I, I thought of as well. So um, let me start with a question from the audience that was asked in, in a couple of ways, a couple of times, it's around privacy, whether it is in, in the work that uh, you are leading uh, supply or in your work, uh, Bartik, you know, how do we protect, ensure patient privacy and, and uh, people privacy? Any, any thoughts on that? I can go into a little bit of detail on that. Um, so privacy is something which we all take very seriously. It's a basic fundamental human right. And we all want to be careful about how information about ourselves is disclosed to others. Um, in terms of the very rich data analytics that we do, we made a business decision 15 years ago where we said that we do not want access to any kind of protected health information at all. I'm very happy we made that decision. We've seen some of the issues that other large players in this uh, arena are running into with partnerships with hospitals where hundreds of employees may have, may have access to some very private protected health information. And so the optics of it don't look good. There's legal issues around it. We wanted nothing to do with it. We realized that if you're good about scrubbing out all of the protected health information, making it truly 100% de-identified, there's a lot more you can do with the data. And with large data amounts like that, which are now uh, open for clinical use and research purposes, that, that's truly powerful. And that, that's how we're able to make some of the changes in this COVID-19 world we live in today. Thank you so much. Well, if I can add to that, yes, the side managed with his company to de-identify, but privacy is still an issue really. Yeah. Because uh, privacy is an issue because we don't know what data will be shared. I mean, we yeah. hope there will be privacy all the time, but we all think privacy is there, but every now and then we hear there is a break in the privacy. The other problem with the privacy is the selective use of the data. I mean, just deleting or adding data uh, that might hurt the person, the communities, the districts, the states, whatever it is. The last thing about privacy, uh, privacy is uh, related to the user. So uh, if he wants to stay private or to respect privacy, then it is done. But if they want to go beyond that, for somebody to go beyond, then who can protect it? This is a major concern really for most people who can use artificial intelligence or any form of computing as such. Thank you, very well said. We had this issue in a few projects uh, where we go to patients and we perform some tests with them. And usually we don't have big issues. After we explain it to them that this is a research project and to train AI, we need data. We, cannot, we humans cannot also learn if we don't have, don't have data. We need to have the data. When we explain it to, the, to our patients and the users that we anonymize this data, we're not interested in their you know, name, address and phone number and so on, then it's usually, it's usually uh, very well understood by, by our uh, patients and test users. Thank you. And if I may just, uh, I, I'm sorry, did I interrupt anyone? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, only, uh, only one sentence. We have yes, a very yes. restrictive law in Europe uh, uh, about the private legacy. And uh, it is uh, very difficult uh, to get the data for research. 
we have a big uh, uh, project from the uh, from our government to get the, uh, all medita medical records uh, free to research, but it is not done yet. Uh, and so for each research, we have to have uh, the, the special aloneness from the uh, ethic committee and the per permission for each single person uh, who is going to, to, to get us data and the data had to be protected. And this is very difficult uh, to, to get this done. And uh, it is a lot of work in each university to get the data uh, in a safe data, data bank. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, we have to a little bit uh, uh, make it easier for the researcher. And uh, I do hope with, uh, in, in Germany, we'll get the, the agenda done in uh, 2021. Thank you so much. Um, so, so, you know, we saw from your presentation, uh, you shared uh, some examples where uh, machine learning is able to diagnose with like 99% accuracy, 99.9 accuracy, uh, very, very high accuracy rate. Um, still, you know, a question that is that often comes up in, in uh, machine learning circles is interpretability. And um, if we move away from uh, decision trees, which are sort of easy to interpret and understand, and you know, because we we have to for certain problems, we have to use sort of high, you know, more complex and higher higher dimensional models. Um, what are your thoughts around? You know, do we trust it as is? Is it a decision support tool? Um, any concerns about using black boxes? Anyone who, who wants to jump on this? So if I start about the black box, really, uh, black box is a problem. It is a secret, it's a trade secret also. Because if you don't know like how the machine works to say, okay, it is safe, how can you trust it? This is one issue. The other issue, if you want to change the algorithms to skew the data, you can do that very easy. Anybody can do that. The third problem is if you are going to decide the goals rather than to reach the goals, then you can do that. So it's always a problem, but it depends who is doing the project, of course. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. From the, uh, from the scientific view, when you have the method which is uh, have an accuracy over ninety percent, you are excellent. Uh, you are expert. You can do everything what you want. And uh, I, I was uh, very surprised that uh, with machine learning and uh, the, the the program from Hemisphere, the, from Sergi Sphere from Chicago, from uh, uh, Sapan that they achieved this uh, this amount of accuracy only with almost 6,000 patients. I, I know that in, in your data right now are uh, 10 times more patients and uh, probably it is a little bit lower, but it's, it's, uh, it is showing how exact they work before, how they program the, uh, the machine, learning, uh, machine, machine learning program and uh, how they just added the, the data and uh, how uh, to, cheat, to teach the machine uh, to uh, have such a precise result. And uh, that was uh, probably also the, the reason why we had such an amount of accuracy in, in this uh, uh, particular uh, example. Yeah, I, I have a comment about that. Thank you very much for that. Um, in, I think the other thing that model shows is that we also have to be very careful about overfitting. Um, as, as these algorithms start to unfold and you start to get a little bit more fitting than what's clinically indicated, you start getting into the decimal points on 99.999% accuracy. And this is where actually having a larger data set and pruning the trees and, and being a little bit more um, careful about how well the model is fit to the data can actually lead to overall improvements in clinical efficacy. Um, and that's, that's actually the reason why in, in the severity scoring tool where we had uh, almost 10 times as many patients, the accuracy actually dropped a little bit. And we were okay with that uh, because now we're having a better clinical impact with some of this. Um, to go to Munir's uh, comments earlier, I, 
I agree to an extent about the black box. You know, it, the, the black box, it has a scary implication. You know, you start thinking about the CIA and you wonder what else is going on with these algorithms. Um, but with that said, no one is going to argue with IBM when, when Big Blue makes a uh, machine that beats the world's number one chess player. At, at the end of the day, you look at what the output is. And if it takes a sophisticated machine learning algorithm to get there, and you can reproduce the results, and you can demonstrate how you got those results, you've met a very high level of burden of evidence in the scientific world. So you, you're right. If, if you're keeping it as a trade secret, you're not open about the disclosures, you're not open about how the algorithms work, that could lead to a problem. But if you're transparent and you use good data and good algorithms and good communication to do it, that's a very different world. I agree on the, trans, on the transparency aspect because, you know, I'm in the machine learning sort of domain and uh, I distinguish between in transparency and interpretability. Yeah. Transparency is about explaining what data you used, uh, the, the experimental setup, the, the algorithms, uh, having your uh, results open and public and uh, even allowing people to run their own data sets through it. Interpretability is about explaining how a particular decision was made. Yeah. And while many researchers are you know, working on that, it's really difficult when you have millions of parameters interacting together in a nonlinear way to make yeah. sense out of it. Never yeah. mind millions, you know, few dozens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that remains sort of uh, a difficult goal for, for all of us. Um, let me squeeze maybe a couple of more questions. We have uh, five, six minutes remaining. And um, so we saw some examples, impressive use of AI and machine learning to, to help sort of uh, uh, us with the COVID-19 challenge. Any gaps, any, any areas that you gentlemen did not see and would like to uh, see some uh, of the machine learning in the machine learning community start to address? There is one very important gap very, very critical gap here. So we, back in March, we saw a signal in our database that there was a, the beginning of a worldwide pandemic going on. It was just a few thousand cases, but it was a signal like no other, almost like a uh, alien intelligence contacting SETI with a supernova saying that we are here. And the biggest challenge we ran into was helping others around us understand the capabilities that machine learning and big data had in this space. Getting the tools built was the easy part. Getting them distributed to people who could use it at the front lines was the hard part. And it's because there's so little that the scientific community, the public and public health leaders understand about the power of good big data and good machine learning. And so helping, helping to fix the education gap would make a big difference. Very well, thank you. Other comments? Yep. So the other gap really, which I see is uh, to have a parallel interest between the political arena and the scientific arena. Uh, and this is the major problem. Actually, the delay was between December and March really was politics, economy, and uh, should we do or not? So if you leave the decisions to the machine, that's okay. But if you selectively modify the results of the machine, that is the problem. Yeah. So again, trust in the machine and trust in the people uh, giving the result is a major gap so far. Thank you. Let me see if I can get uh, another question from uh, uh, the audience here. I, th I think uh, for a number of questions on and I think when you started talking about this, which is about the challenges, uh, some of the challenges that we face in implementing some of these AI strategies uh, in the regional and sort of country levels. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure if anybody wants to add to Munir's comments, but that there was a question around that from the audience. You know, the other, um, the other challenge is that Conrad and Munir both talked about this a little bit. 
Um, and, and so did Bartek, you know, this, what this really goes to is the quality of your machine learning, the robots you're building, the algorithms we're building goes towards getting high quality data at the end of the day. Your algorithms and robots are only as good as the quality of the data collection and the volume of data collection. And so opening up access to hospital systems, EHRs, financial systems, supply chain systems, again, with very careful considerations around protecting the critical private information, but at least sharing the data that leads to advances in research. We, we did that with the New England. We're doing, you're doing this with the robots you're creating, which are phenomenal. There's, there's something to be said about open, open access to data. Yes, thank you so much. Which, which actually invites another question. How can uh, people uh, access uh, sort of your data and, and contribute to it and, and be part of the movement that you guys are creating? Call us. <laughs> it's free. It, it doesn't cost Fantastic. anything and we are happy to collaborate. Fantastic. This is, this is really good. Um, I, I, I have to say, Go ahead. I can tell you, Khalid, we are using his data. We are yes. at a, the matter called him and we are doing a lot of research with him. We are. F fantastic. Listen, uh, uh, we are running out of time. You know, a few years ago, uh, maybe six or seven years ago, I attended a PhD uh, defense from a friend of mine uh, in pharmacology at the University of Minnesota. And other than, if I missed the first maybe three, four slides in his presentation, the first five minutes or, or 10 minutes from the presentation, which lasts for an hour, I would have thought that I am sitting at a machine learning conference, with all honesty. So um, it's amazing how different fields are, are coming together. And, and this is sort of the nature of the beast, yeah? Innovations often happen at the intersection of different uh, uh, disciplines. And in this instance, it's computer science and machine learning, engineering, and, and medicine. And as I hear you guys uh, speak uh, and, and, and uh, make your presentations, I often come to something that, uh, you know, I, I say in my circles, which is outside of medicine, which is uh, if machine learning uh, applications were a dish, then that dish requires three ingredients, data, subject matter expertise, and AI expertise, you know, because data is the key. It's the input and the output from the machine. This is what we used to train. And subject matter expertise, and in this case, physicians and, and, and bio, uh, biochemists and, and, and so on, um, are key not just to, um, they're not just the users of the machine learning algorithms. They are also part designers because you need to capture the nuances of the domain in a way that, that the machine can compute on. And, and you guys demonstrated this very well and lastly, of course, you need uh, the scientists and engineers who can build some of these models. This has been um, fascinating and a unique session. And at least for me, you know, I don't get to say to my fellow panelists often, uh, thank you for saving lives. And I mean that literally. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, excellent presentations, fascinating discussion. Uh, very much enjoyed it, and I and thank you for the audience uh, who joined this session. Thank you for your questions. I hope you found it uh, informative and uh, uh, interesting. This will be uh, available on uh, Trends Research YouTube channel. Um, uh, so uh, if you uh, didn't have to watch it or part of it, you can watch it and, and share it. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.